Hebrews in the Americas, in the curses of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. The Nawa, polities, or people, Mesoamerica, the Aztec Empire, Mexica, the Mexicans. June 24th, 1520. The Americas. Mexico. Mexico. Tenochtitlan. Nahua. Mexica people. Mesoamerica. Location of Tenochtitlan, Mexico, Tenochtitlan, June fifteen twenty. The city state of Tenochtitlan was at its peak in terms of population between fourteen fifty and fifteen twenty. It's estimated it had roughly two hundred thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants during the span of time. This made the capital of the Aztec Empire one of the biggest cities in the world. Deuteronomy 2849 NIV The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand. A fierce-looking nation, without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, no wine, or olive oil, nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flocks, until you are ruined. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land, until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. Was the downfall of the Aztec Empire the fulfillment of a curse placed on their ancient ancestors recorded in the Hebrew Bible and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28? Were the inhabitants of Mesoamerica, the Nahua, the Aztecs, a people living under a curse, and their empire predicted to fall thousands of years before the Spanish Empire's soldiers stepped into the valley of Mexico, which had one of the highest population concentrations in the world, with about one million people? The Indians and Ethiopians of Ancient Palestine, Part 4. Universal Center for Renovation, where the Word is made flesh, presents historical and biblical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. Hebrews in the Americas, in the Curses of the Book of Deuteronomy 28. Adam Clark. Adam Clark, 1762 to the 26th of October, 1832, was a British Methodist theologian who served time as president of the Wesleyan Methodist Conference, 1806 to 1807, 1814 to 1815, and 1822 to 1823. A biblical scholar, he published an influential Bible commentary, among other works. He was a Wesleyan. Adam Clark's biblical commentary contained six volumes and took him 40 years to write. 
In this commentary, he wrote about the ultimate fate of the ancient Hebrews. His commentary on the locations of the northern kingdom populations, as well as the southern kingdom's populations, was amazing and astute, considering the social politics of his days during the 18th and 19th century. It certainly provides an inspiration for those who believe that seek and you shall find, and that the truth endures on forever. Despite our contemporary secular world's opposition to it, the persistence of lies and half-truths that fill the world's present educational institutions with biased misrepresentations of global biblical historiography. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hila and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. His commentary on the book of Second Kings chapter 17, verse 5 and 6, concerning the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel and the exile of the Hebrews out of their land is educational. It gives a glimpse into antiquity for those who want to understand the events of history that are recorded in the Bible. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. The Assyrian Empire destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and went to war against its capital city, Samaria, and captured it. The year was 722 B.C., fulfilling a curse placed on their ancestors in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. If they refused to uphold the will and laws of their creator, he would send nations from afar to destroy their country and exile them from their homeland. And so, in the Eastern Hemisphere, the Assyrian Empire invaded the land of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The Assyrian armies invaded the capital city of the Northern Tribes of Israel, destroying all of their national institutions. The Tribes of Israel became tributaries and subject in the Assyrian Empire. In order to promote their form of identity universalism and discourage ethnic nationalistic tendencies, the Assyrians had a national policy of mass forced relocation, deportation, which accompanied enslavement. The goal was assimilation by Assyrianization or Syrianization, to erase the remembrance of the existence of the tribes of Israel from their memories by exiling them from their land where they would take on foreign customs and a new identity. Although Clark doesn't make mention of it in this commentary, along with Israel, the nation states of Ammon, Moab, and Edom were also conquered, enslaved, Assyrianized, or Syrianized, and became vassal states and provinces of the Assyrian Empire. This is important to know in understanding the rise of the populations, kingdoms, and history of Central Asia and early Eurasia history. But that is a tale for another time. To erase the remembrance of the existence of the tribes of Israel from their memories by exiling them from their land where they would take on foreign customs and a new identity. The plan was to place them in regional locales inside the Assyrian Empire in hopes that they would believe themselves to be Assyrians and not Hebrews. And so, the Hebrews were sent to the colonized regions within the Assyrian Empire. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hila 
and in Habor by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Verse 5. Besieged it three years. It must have been well fortified, well provisioned, and well defended to have held out so long. Verse 6. Took Samaria. According to the prophets, Hosea chapter 4 and 8 and Micah chapter 6, he exercised great cruelties on this miserable city, ripping up women with child, dashing young children against the stones, etc., etc. Carried Israel away into Assyria. What were the places to which the unfortunate Israelites were carried? Or where their successors are now situated? have given rise to innumerable conjectures, dissertations, discourses, etc. Some maintain that they are found on the coast of Guinea, others in America. The Indian tribes being the descendants of those carried away by the Assyrians. Adam Clark's commentary reveals the failure of the Assyrians to assimilate the Hebrew tribes within their empire. He mentions that in time, the Hebrews journeyed from the Middle East to eventually colonize the Western Hemisphere, where they are now called the Indians of the Western Hemisphere, or the New World. Carried Israel away into Assyria. What were the places to which the unfortunate Israelites were carried? or where their successors are now situated, have given rise to innumerable conjectures, dissertations, discourses, etc. Some maintain that they are found on the coast of Guinea, others in America, the Indian tribes being the descendants of those carried away by the Assyrians. Coast of Guinea, West Africa, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. He also reveals that members of the southern kingdom ended up as colonies and communities in the interiors of Africa, West Africa, Belad el Sudan community. Coast of Guinea, West Africa, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Guinea is a traditional name for the region of the coast of West Africa, which lies along the Gulf of Guinea. It is a naturally moist tropical forest, or savanna, that stretches along the coast and borders the Sahel Belt in the north. A map of Negroland and Guinea, with the European settlements. Herman Mall, 1727. Coast of Guinea, West Africa, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. It is believed the Portuguese borrowed Guineas from the Berber term Genawen, sometimes Arabized as Genaoa or Genawa, meaning the burnt people, analogous to the classical Greek Aethiops of the burnt face. The Berber terms Agano and Akal and Aganoan mean black and the land of the blacks, respectively. Balada Sudan, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Carried Israel away into Assyria. What were the places to which the unfortunate Israelites were carried, or where their successors are now situated, have given rise to innumerable conjectures, dissertations, discourses, etc.? Some maintain that they are found on the coast of Guinea, others in America the Indian tribes being the descendants of those carried away by the Assyrians. But let us put our focus on the northern kingdom of Israel, where even to the ends of the earth or western hemisphere, the curses of the book of Deuteronomy pursued them, and an empire was sent to destroy their empire. Not the Assyrians, but this time it was the Spanish empire. Ultimately, it was their creator's will to chastise them, for disobeying his will and laws. This is a really complex history, but
but through the lens of the biblical records, we can understand how history is not just some random set of events, but a predestined plan. The Storming of the Teocalli, 1848, Emmanuel Loiza. The Storming of the Teocalli, Cortes, with stout armored band, fights his way back into Tenochtitlan, June. 1520. Hernan Cortes, 18th century portrait of Cortes based on the one sent by the conqueror to Paolo Jovio, which has served as a model for many of his representations since the 16th century. First governor of New Spain. Born in Medellin, Spain, to a family of lesser nobility, Cortes chose to pursue adventure and riches in the New World. He went to Hispanola and later to Cuba, where he received an encomienda, the right to labor of certain subjects. For a short time, he served as alcalde, magistrate of the second Spanish town founded on the island. In 1519, he was elected captain of the third expedition to the mainland, which he partly funded. His enmity with the government of Cuba, Diego Velazquez de Cuellar, resulted in the recall of the expedition at the last moment, an order which Cortes ignored. Arriving on the continent, Cortes executed a successful strategy of allying with some indigenous people against others. He also used a native woman, Donna Marina, as an interpreter. She later gave birth to his first son. When the governor of Cuba sent emissaries to arrest Cortes, he fought them and won, using the extra troops as reinforcements. Cortes wrote letters directly to the king, asking to be acknowledged for his successes instead of being punished for mutiny. After he overthrew the Aztec Empire, Cortes was awarded the title of Marquis del Valle de Oaxaca, while the more prestigious title of Viceroy was given to the high-ranking nobleman Antonio de Mendoza. In 1541, Cortes returned to Spain, where he died six years later of natural causes. Marina, or Malinson, circa 1500 to circa 1529, more popularly known as La Malinche, a Nahue woman from the Mexican Gulf Coast, became known for contributing to the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, 1519 to 1521, by acting as an interpreter, advisor, and intermediary for the Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes. She was one of the 20 enslaved women given to the Spaniards in 1519 by the natives of Tabasco. Cortes chose her as a consort, and she later gave birth to his first son, Martin, one of the first mestizos, people of mixed European and indigenous American ancestry in New Spain. Battle of Simpaola the situation as reconstructed by modern historians is not as melodramatic as the summary and description appearing in the passages from Prescott below. Cortes, having exited to Nochtitlan with most of his forces to deal with the Spanish forces from Cuba, hostile to his enterprise, overcame and absorbed them. The combined force then re-entered the Mexica city on June 24th without opposition, to rejoin the beleaguered Alvarado and his men, only then to find themselves pent up and in effect besieged within the now hostile city which had turned against Cortes and the captive Montezuma. The Spanish Empire made alliances with certain Mexican tribes, 
but sometimes Spanish and Mexican Indians fought together against the Spanish Empire. History is rife with the fluidity of alliances spurred on by self-interest and common interest. The Battle of Simpaola was fought on 27th May, 1520, at Simpaola, Mexico. Between the forces of Penfilo de Narvaez and the forces of Hernan Cortes, and these joint forces of Mexica, Indians, and Spanish soldiers defeated the armies of the Spanish Empire. which was supported by the Chenatec warriors. In these dark days, brother fought against brother as some Mexica Indians fought on the side of the Spanish Empire against Mexica Indian. The Tlaxcalan Senate, depiction of the Tlaxcalan government by Rodrigo Gutierrez, 1875. Mexica Indians who joined the Spanish Empire held councils about this new empire that invaded their homelands, and decisions were made to assimilate and join the foreign empire to become Spanish. As a result of their alliance with the Spaniards, Tlaxcala had Hidalgo privileged status within Spanish colonial Mexico as confirmed in the royal writ of the foundation of the city of Tlaxcala, Mexico. After the Spanish conquered Tenochtitlan and the rest of Mexico, Tlaxcala was allowed to survive and preserve his pre-Columbian culture. In addition, as a reward to the Tlaxcalans' unyielding loyalty to the Spanish, the city and its inhabitants in addition, as a reward to the Tlaxcalans' unyielding loyalty to the Spanish, the city and its inhabitants largely escaped the pillaging and destruction following the Spanish conquest. The Tlaxcalans gave further assistance in the Mexican War. Aristocratic Mexican Indians of Tlaxcalan were made Hidalgos or members of the nobility of the Spanish Empire within colonial Mexico. Many modern-day elites of Mexico are of Tlaxcalan noble heritage, men that earn noble status in the Spanish Empire but are not from Spain. Not all men have the same status and condition, even in subjugation. Appointment to Governorship of Mexico and internal dissensions. A painting from Diego Munoz Camargo's history of Tlaxcala, Linzo Tlaxcala, circa 1585, showing La Meleche in Hernan Cortes. But it should be noted, not all the Spanish were happy with the conquest of Mexico. Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, Habsburg, Spain. Many historical sources have conveyed an impression that Cortes was unjustly treated by the Spanish crown and that he received nothing but ingratitude for his role in establishing New Spain. This picture is the one Cortes presents in his letters and in the later biography written by Francisco Lopez de Gamara. However, there may be more to the picture than this. Cortes's own sense of accomplishment, entitlement, and vanity may have played a part in his deteriorating position with the king. The king of Spain was not pleased with the things Hernan Cortes did in Mexico. Empire of New Spain, 1521-1821 Charles V, 
Habsburg ruler of Spain. King Charles appointed Cortes as governor, captain general, and chief justice of the newly conquered territory, dubbed New Spain of the Ocean Sea. But also, much to the dismay of Cortes, four royal officials were appointed at the same time to assist him in his governing, in effect submitting him to close observation and administration. Cortes initiated the construction of Mexico City, destroying Aztec temples and buildings, and then rebuilding on the Aztec ruins what soon became the most important European city in the Americas. A panel from the painting in the Larco Museum in Lima, Peru, depicting the Inca Empress. This panel shows the last seven Inca Emperors and the subsequent first European Emperor of the Inca, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, Carlos Quinto, as the 15th Inca Emperor. The painting can be dated circa 1800 because the last two entries are Carlos Tichero, Charles III, as the 24th Inca Emperor, and his son, Carlos IV, Charles IV, House of Bourbon, as the 25th Inca Emperor. Charles IV reigned as King of Spain from December 14, 1788 to March 19, 1808, abdicated in favor of his son, Ferdinand the Seventh. The monarchs of Europe, historically known as the Black Nobility, were of Hebrew origin and had been looking for the lost tribes of Israel for centuries. They wanted to convert the lost tribes to Christianity and obtain their aid in their wars with the Muslim world. Money, gold, and greed ruined these plans when ambitious men arose to prominence, power, and influence. Habsburg royal family of Hebrew origin, Philip II of Spain, 1527 to 1598. Eventually, these monarchs would lose their thrones to the same elements in their kingdoms. This book explains some of the discussions that were being held in the highest circles within Spain, in the intellectual circles of the king's court, there were scholars that knew that the indigenous of the Americas were descendants of Israel. They were aware that their origins and the origins of the Mexica, Mexican Indians, was the same. Both children of Jacob. What a dilemma. The Oxford History of Historical Writing Although scholars have presented it as contrived and ludicrous, Spanish strategy to cast a conquest in the legal language of the just war, the requirimiento, is better explained as part of a larger typological interpretation of colonization. For the jurist who drafted the document, the conquest was the fulfillment of Joshua 3, 7-13 and 6, 16-21. Israelite Spaniards gave the Canaanite Indians an ultimatum to clear the promised land or face destruction. The royal Spanish elite knew they were Israelites, like themselves, but there was a group among them who tried to justify the conquest by lying and calling the Indians of Mexica Canaanites. Clear the promised land or face destruction. Such biblical arguments were pervasive. They surfaced, for example, in the frontispiece of Antonio de Leon, Pinello's Chudado de las Conformaciones, Reels de Encomedias, Treaties on the Legal Foundations of the Encomedia, 1620. This legal commentary on the laws of the Indies has the Incas 
as the hairs of Jacob's son Issachar, destined to bow their shoulders to bear and become a servant unto tribute. Genesis 49 and 15. The problem was there were men who refused to lie and they told the truth about the origin of the Indians of Mexica or Mexico. The truth was that they were derived from the son of Jacob, Issachar. And according to the curses of biblical prophecy, Issachar would be enslaved in a tributary. The frontispiece also presents the conquest of Tenochtitlan as the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 20 and 11. If the terms of surrender and enslavement are refused, Israelite Spanards should spare no one, save women, children, and livestock. Although Sanchez was building on this tradition of typological readings of colonization, he managed to transform it into a discourse of election. The two sides debated what should be done. They ultimately came to the conclusion that because the Indians of Mexica were Issachar, they had to become enslaved and pay tribute. In their minds, they found a Torah-based legal precedent for the subjugation, economic exploitation, and enslavement of the nobility and the people of Mexica, not as Canaanites, but as Issacharites. The Israelite element among the Spanish Empire, noble, merchant, and soldier, agreed to this. Eventually, they too would lose their thrones and empire as a result of bad choices and the will of their Creator, for they too, being of Israel, were subject to the same curses. as would the Hebrew nobles, merchants, soldiers, and people in West Africa. This game of thrones is deep. How can you understand the game when you don't know the players? When you don't understand the rules of the game? Hebrews in the Americas and the curses of the book of Deuteronomy 28. The Indians and Ethiopians of Ancient Palestine, Part 4. More to come.